This show is brought to you by our generous patrons at patreon.com slash falloutlorecast. Robots Radio presents the Fallout Lorecast. Welcome to the Fallout Lorecast, a place for the Fallout community to come together to explore the boundaries of our knowledge about the world of Fallout. With President's Day coming up, I thought I would do something super patriotic. Well, maybe overly, just over the top patriotic. I haven't spoken yet on this show about Liberty Prime. We've talked about all sorts of different topics. We've talked about all sorts of different groups and robots and things like that. But Liberty Prime hasn't been the specific topic of any of the episodes so i thought it would be time to bring this up and and liberty prime was actually a uh, a suggested topic of one of our listeners recently so i was like hey you know what it's time to talk about liberty prime and it's one of those topics that i've avoided honestly because it has a lot to do with two of the endings of two of the games fallout 3 and fallout 4 or at least one of the endings of fallout 4 has a lot to do with Liberty Prime, so it's kind of spoilery. So if you don't want spoilers on this episode about either of those two games, just be aware. Now, those games have been out for a while at this point, so eh, just, you know, <laughs> just just be aware. So Liberty Prime, gigantic American capitalist robot. And he's going to be here to help me out a little bit with uh, this episode because he's got a few things to say. And that's one of the wonderful aspects of Liberty Prime is that Liberty Prime always has wonderful things to say because he's got opinions like communism is a lie and the last domino falls here. That's one of my favorite. The last domino falls here. <laughs> this, <laughs> so, so many of these phrases that he uses are just over the top. But let's, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go into the details. Who is Liberty Prime? If you haven't gotten that far in Fallout 3 or Fallout 4 to find out who exactly Liberty Prime is, I, I've said so far Liberty Prime is a big robot, but he's a very specific Robot. He is the largest of the creations of the military, the, the U.S. military during the Great War and specifically leading up to the uh, before the, the actual quote unquote Great War, the dropping of the bombs that led to the wasteland that we know and love the <laughs> the the conflict in Anchorage was heating up. The communists had invaded. The year was 2072. And if you know the dates, that's five years before the bombs drop, right? The communists had invaded Anchorage. The Americans were trying to push them back out, the communists specifically being the Chinese. And we were, we, as if this is somehow this version of reality. But as, as an American citizen, the Americans were stuck in, mired in a, a dangerous conflict. And the U.S. military was looking for a means to really stick it to the Chinese. And like the Americans do, they were looking for not only a way to capitalize on pushing them out, but to really make a statement. And their solution was, let's design the largest robot ever. <laughs> This walking embodiment of democracy and capitalism that could come onto the battlefield and wipe the communists out while also speaking the mantra of the people. Basically, this is I mean, obviously, it's absolutely ridiculous, but it also represents just the the attitude of the people of the time and this idea of, I don't know, the rhetoric and the, 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 the kind of the need for not only attacking the enemy 
physically with dual laser beams from the robot's head and nuclear bombs shooting out of the robot's back, but also for attacking the ideology of the enemy by spouting things like democracy will never be defeated or maybe also democracy is truth communism is death now whether that messaging was more for the enemy or more to bolster and continue to i don't know influence the other military members of your own society is maybe it's a little bit of both that's up to debate but this is how the robot functioned so it was 2072 and well at least this is how the robot was planning to function this was the plan right and the the military got together with a few of the industries the the companies that you would expect robco and general atomics international in order to design and build a robot but things didn't go to plan they couldn't actually get the robot working how they wanted to they tried to reach out to vault tech to see if vault tech could help but vault tech was too busy working on other things and they also tried to reach out to the designer that they needed in order to get the power supply online because they designed a robot that needed so much power to work the AI, the machine parts, like the, the walking, the physicality of the, the robot itself because it was so large, but then also the weapons, the lasers and, and the, the mechanics of it, that they couldn't get all of the power they needed portable and working on the robot at the same time. And the only man that they realized that could help do this was Dr. Stanislaus Braun. And if you remember from the previous episodes, that name, Dr. Stanislaus Braun, was already in seclusion because Dr. Stanislaus Braun is the guy who was working with vault Tech designing the vaults, but he was also the guy that was ended up in the vault, in the VR vault. Remember, remember Tranquility Lane? Remember the crazy guy that was pretending to be the little girl that was messing with the the host of people stuck in the vault in Tranquility Lane. Remember that vault? That's Dr. Stanislaus Braun. And he was not available anymore because he was busy, secluded in Vault 112 in a VR simulation. And it wasn't until after he was already in that vault doing his thing that they realized the the difficulty of the power supply and at, at that point i guess they couldn't reach out to him and he was no longer available so they never finished the project to get liberty prime up and running by the end of the alaskan campaign so they threw a bunch of soldiers at it and of course solved it using power armor but that didn't mean that things went as well as they had hoped. There was lots of loss of life. It took a lot longer than they had hoped in order to push the Chinese off of the American soil in Alaska. And poor Liberty Prime was left only functioning partially. The robot could walk. It could walk. It could talk. It could process. And this is another part of this. Remember, Robots in Fallout have their own AI components. They are not simple machines. They have to have enough processing power to make complex decisions on their own. Think about Mr. Handy. Mr. Handy actually has a complex uh, decision making cal in calculations and, and things like that, even for just doing the laundry and helping with the baby and, you know, cooking dinner. It's still it's processing things on a kind of nearly intelligence self-aware kind of setting to the point where some of them actually become kind of sentient right and they start really doing a little bit more than their processing is supposed to do well liberty prime is very similar to that liberty prime has a complex ai that's able to process and do things on a near human level of ai so it could do all of those things as long as it didn't power up its weapons 
And that was very frustrating to the robot. The robot didn't understand why it couldn't power up its weapons, but it could walk around and talk and do all of these other things. But as soon as it powered up its weapons, the other processes would go offline and all of a sudden it would power down or whatever. Right. It was very frustrating. Like, imagine imagine if like every time you decided to like do a math problem, all of a sudden your leg stopped working. Right? Like this would be super weird. You'd have problems doing things. So. They turned off the robot and they hid it away underneath the Pentagon. One of the safest places they could think of. Okay, so we're going to stick it underneath the Pentagon in the Capitol and we'll figure out this power solution on another day. Well, another day never came because as we know, in October of 2077, the bombs dropped and everything went to hell. So let's fast forward 180 some years, 170 some years, 2255 in the Capitol Wastes. And this is during the events of Fallout 3. Owen Lyons, the leader of the Brotherhood of Steel, now over on the East Coast, arrives in Washington. And as happens so often with the Brotherhood of Steel, they discover something and this is their job. I mean, this is what they're looking to do. They're looking to find remnants of the old civilization, old technology and see how they can use it and to keep it out of the hands of just common people who would misuse that technology. And this totally fits the bill. A giant robot, a giant intelligent robot designed to destroy communists. Now, imagine if somebody in the future, in you know, 200-ish years almost, in the future was to discover this and tinkering around was able to power the thing back up, even partially. And imagine if the AI core on this thing was broken and misunderstood who the communists were. The destructive power of this would have been very dangerous. Well, Owen Lyons understands what he's come across and also the potential benefits to the Brotherhood. So for 20 years, they decide to undertake a project to recommission the robot because this could be a great asset to the Brotherhood in the Capital Wastes. And let's think back to Fallout 3. What are they dealing with in the Capital Wastes? So not only we, we know they end up dealing with the Enclave. The Enclave are the big baddies, but for most of their time in the Capital Wastes, they are dealing with super mutants and not just any super mutants, really dumb super mutants. The super mutants on the East Coast are not intelligent. But one thing that is interesting about them is that the older they get, the longer they've been there. Oh, and there's many of them, but the, the longer they've been there, the more entrenched they are and the older they get, the larger they can grow. We talked about this on the Super Mutant episode. There are Super Mutant behemoths in the Capital Wastes, and you come across them in the game. Some of them are very, very large. And a, a soldier in power armor with laser rifles isn't always enough to deal with this. A group of soldiers with laser rifles in power armor isn't always enough to deal with a super mutant behemoth. These things are huge. They pick you up. They squish you. I mean, you're like a tin can to them. So they're looking for solutions to deal with this problem in the capital waste. So a gigantic robot. I mean, we're talking. I mean, this is like this is like, uh, I don't know, Godzilla versus the giant robot from space or something. I don't know. But like we're, we're talking like B movie sci fi stuff here. Right. But like, hey, why not? Let's recommission this robot. It's like our ancestors left us the the salvation, like the, the right thing we need to solve this problem. But sure enough, they come across the same problems. Right. After 20 years of tinkering with this, using their best scientists and their best engineers, they've only been able to restore 46% of the power to the internal processors, 45% to the weapons and 37 to the management systems. 
and they've tried redistributing the power. They've tried using components that they've scavenged from the wasteland. They've tried rebuilding parts of Liberty Prime, and there's only so much they can do, but they can't get it back online. They're having a hard time. And on top of that, they've got the AI kind of working again, but again, the robot is confused. It doesn't understand why things just don't work, which is frustrating to the scribes. It's kind of driving them nuts, which has got to be interesting to be part of in some of those conversations, like Liberty Prime asking things about like, you know, why are the communists tampering with my weapons, you know, like or whatever, like no Liberty, like that's not what happened. It's it's just like we can't get everything up online. It's nothing. Nothing like that is happening, you know. Yeah, like, no, it's okay. It's okay, Liberty Prime. Just power down. You're good. You're good. Um, but the, the robot didn't like this. This created some more issues, and they tried to fool Liberty Prime's subroutines. Like, they tried to actually fool the AI on the robot that when they tried to draw the power away from the weapons, that it, it was cool. It wasn't actually being drawn away from the weapons, but the AI on board detected the attempt and it fried out some of the circuitry like it it totally backfired pushed the project back a few months and then there was another attempt that was made later in uh july of 2277 and then there was a another faulty power capacitor spike which derailed things again and dropped power on board Liberty Prime down to the lowest levels that they that they'd had. It was up in the 40 percent and 30 percent all the way down to 12, 13 and 1 percent, respectively. Things were just tanking the project. So at this point, the Brotherhood started to get really desperate here. Now, the individuals who were working on this include uh, Reginald Rothschild. So uh, Reginald Rothschild was the head scribe. You may recognize that name from Fallout 3. And they uh, he was inspired by Dr. Madison Lee at River City and used some of Madison Lee's research on um, accelerated vector fusion in order to try to come up with a breakthrough for this stuff. Well, of course, things didn't work out again and created an accidental weapon discharge, which almost killed Elder Lions like this. Things went really bad here. And so they had to be even more careful. They actually impose stricter controls on experimentation with the giant robot. So things are not looking good, but they kept working and eventually they were able to restore power and improve distribution to the internal processors. And they got it up to 87% and they got the weapons up to 60%. So the best levels they were able to get so far, but Power management was still inefficient and the mobility and navigations were just at zero percent still. They couldn't get the machine working and moving, but the voice module still worked at 100 percent. So the robot was still talking to them. So whenever they powered the robot up, it was still saying all sorts of fun stuff and, you know, telling them things like, Communist threat assessment. Minimal. Scanning defenses. <laughs> and just like, you know, happy to fill them in on details, uh, which I'm sure was driving them nuts. And especially because it was mocking the researchers, too. And we don't have those lines in the game, so I can't play those. But can you imagine this robot being frustrated with not being able to walk and do stuff that and he's like mocking the researchers on not being able to put his body back together correctly and power up his his you know parts i think that sounds awesome so when <laughs> when the enclave seized project purity now remember the events of fallout 3 the whole attempt to get actual clean water and then the enclave seizes things and then of course there's the whole thing with your father and all of those details remember that um madison lee arrives at the citadel the 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 base that the the Brotherhood makes on top of the Pentagon, which was there on purpose. The reason they built that base on top of the Pentagon was because Liberty Prime was underneath it. That's why they chose that location, not because it was the Pentagon per se, but because Liberty Prime was there. That was the main reason. Now, 
she was able to bring her experience directly to the project. It was no longer that her research was inspiring them. It was that she was able to work directly with Rothschild and the two of them together were able to resolve the power management. So those two minds together were able to make it work. And then the robot was able to come online. And this is when you get to the end game of Fallout 3 and Liberty Prime comes online. And I'm not going to go into the details of the end game here because it's worth seeing for yourself the giant robot up and working. And I talked about this before. Two gigantic lasers shooting out of its head. <laughs> Missiles, all sorts of things. Things stomping around, talking, you know, talking about communists and stuff. It's pretty great. So that's the events of Fallout 3. But at the end of those events, there is a situation where the robot is destroyed. The Enclave pushes back and there's an event where poor old Liberty Prime gets busted up. But that's not the last we see of Liberty Prime because there's more of him in Fallout 4 and we're going to get to that after we get back from the break. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm totally into stories that are really dense with lore, interesting characters, dark and mysterious worlds, and that's why I'm excited about our sponsor today. You've probably heard of the hit show Shadow and Bone streaming on Netflix, but did you know that that series is based on the Grishaverse, the number one New York Times bestselling books by Lee Bardugo? Now I'm excited because season two of the hit show Shadow and Bone is now streaming on Netflix, but... If you're interested like I am in exploring the universe more or just getting into a really solid fantasy world, then go check out the books. The Grishaverse is a lavish fantasy world in which science and magic collide. So if you haven't already, I recommend you get started with the book Six of Crows. Learn more about Alina Starkov's journey and enjoy a universe that Bustle calls the best magic universe since Harry Potter. To learn more, go to Grishaverse.com. That's G-R-I-S-H-A-V-E-R-S-E.com or go pick up your copy of Six of Crows wherever books are sold. Hello there, old chap. Good to see another of General Atomic's finest still eager to serve. All right, here we are in the middle of the show. And thank you. Thank you to all of our patrons, all 50 of you for helping to support the show. And um, <laughs> we have a new review this this week, too. So I'm going to read that out. But I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you so much to everybody who takes the time to support the show and share it with your friends and it, just use your hard earned money to help make this a full time thing for me. I really do appreciate it. I hope you guys have been enjoying the new content and the new solo format. And uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun making these episodes, kind of going back old school, doing it, doing it the old way by myself. Um, please let me know if you enjoy this format as opposed to the, the other format, which is a little bit more chatty. And I'm, I'm never against making changes and continuing to improve the show. So I'd love to hear your feedback about that. Please let me know personally. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. You can always tweet, tweet at me at robots underscore radio or send me some of your thoughts on Discord, on the Robots Radio Discord. But big thanks to all of our patrons. You guys are amazing, all 50 of you. Thank you so much. We have a patron chat coming up towards the end of the month. That would be, wow, last Tuesday of the month would be next week. Man, because it's a short month, right? So that would be the 22nd. That's uh, just just a little bit away. So let's man, let's get talking. Let's talk on the discord about what you guys would like to chat about. Maybe we could go back and reminisce some about some of these older games. That would be a lot of fun. I hope you guys have also been enjoying the uh, New Vegas playthrough. I've been having a lot of fun with that as well. And seeing you guys show up for those. Those are on Wednesday nights. So if you'd like to come, you know, just hang out with me, you can join me on Twitter or on uh, YouTube. Just look up Robots Radio on Twitter or YouTube and come join me there. Um, but if 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 I've done anything to help you get, you get through your work days, your work week, your drive to work, any of that stuff, then go to 
patreon.com slash fallout lorecast and check out all the different tiers. You don't have to get to the end of the show, like the most recent episodes, to be a patron. In fact, it even helps to get through all the episodes because you don't have any of the ads and any of that stuff. Uh, Plus, you can get T-shirts and join us on future episodes of the show and all that kind of stuff. So thank you to everybody who helps with that. I really do appreciate it. Also, we got a new review in. We've got one from Tristan Brinley from the U.S. who wrote in and said, uh, my favorite lore cast, smiley face, five stars. My name is Tristan. Just wanted to write a review to let everyone know that Robots does an amazing job explaining obscure concepts, knowledge and thought provoking questions. Though I feel pretty seasoned in my lore knowledge, I always leave each episode with new info or more lingering thoughts. (laughs) I almost said questions, but thoughts. I love the patron episodes as well. Keep up the amazing work. Well, thanks, Tristan. I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. All right. Well, that does it for the middle of the show. Let's get back to the rest of the episode. If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. I feel like we need to have Liberty Prime chime in here, too, with a little thing. So how about this one? American casualties. Unacceptable. Overkill protocols authorized. (laughs) Overkill protocols authorized. All right. That's that's a good one. So. All right. So Liberty Prime basically gets gets blown to bits. And so they take what's left of Liberty Prime and they they store them again for some future group to do something with. But it doesn't take that that much time for some future group to do anything with them because it's only about 10 years later that Proctor Ingram was ordered to resume the attempts to fix Liberty Prime in 2287 by none other than Elder Arthur Maxson of the Brotherhood of Steel in the Commonwealth. And so they take all of his components, they load them up on the Pridwin and they move them on over to Boston. And not all of those components travel very well. So, as you know, things like CPUs, power systems, all of that stuff's pretty fragile. There's a reason why you put all that armor around the robot in order to protect those things. So not only was was he blown apart, but a lot of those things didn't actually transit very well. So it takes them some time to piece this big, gigantic robot back together. But what's cool about this is that they've now got some more technology going and they were inspired by some of the work that the Institute was doing. The Brotherhood was looking into the Institute and, of course, the Institute were their enemies. But they they knew of some of the work that they'd been working on and were able to use some of the technology that they had kind of backwards engineered from the Institute in order to redesign some of the components. So we legitimately get a Liberty Prime 2.0 in Fallout 4. They've redesigned like the actuators that move the robot's arms and legs. They use electromagnetic actuators for its body and they redesign other other components. In fact, the uh, the bombs, the the mechanism that shoots and like holds the bombs is redesigned for Mark 28 nuclear bombs instead of the other ones that it was using before. Um, and then the laser beam on the robot's head no longer shoots two individual lasers, but one larger laser that can change the intensity of of its beam like they, they totally revamp the robot. And then even the internal components, the the parts that have to do with the processing, the memory core, all of that stuff. So, for example, there were flaws in its original design, lack of inertial dampeners and titanium or titanium shock casing to protect the memory core for the robot were added in things like this to make Liberty Prime even more effective and better. Now, the last step to bring Liberty Prima back online was getting its fusion core up and running, because after it was destroyed, that part of it had laid in dormant. That's the the phrase here. It wasn't destroyed. It is. It was just off. And. It was turned back online by connecting it up to the power source that was powering the Pridwin. 
Now you have to think about this. The Pridwin was a gigantic flying ship. The power source to fly the Pridwin must have been intense. Keep that thing up there. Well, the reactor was a beryllium agitator. It was new tech. It was something that the Brotherhood had put together to get these ships working. So the power from the ship itself, from the Pridwin itself, was enough to kind of get the components running, but it wasn't enough to kickstart the fusion reactor, if that makes sense. So, for example, it'd be like bringing another battery to get your car running, but it wouldn't be enough to actually get the alternator to start, that kind of thing. So they needed to something with enough power in it to really light the fire, theoretically, in the fusion generator inside Liberty Prime. And this was located in the mass, mass fusion building. That would give the surge of energy needed to kickstart Liberty Prime. So they, so they get all the components ready. Everything's upgraded. Liberty Prime is ready to go. The mass fusion building has what they need to kickstart the fusion generator. And boom, you've got Liberty Prime 2.0. Or V2 is what they end up calling it, right? And it's back. And then you have the end of Fallout 4. And if you side with the Brotherhood, you get to see Liberty Prime come back with a, a head-mounted Liberty laser. They call it the Liberty laser. And a back-mounted supply of Mark 28 nuclear bombs. And you get to watch Liberty Prime walk around destroying stuff. And it's pretty freaking cool. So those of you who have played through that will know exactly how cool all of that stuff is. So there's some fun little details here about just some of the cool stuff around, you know, just some of the little details that show up in the game around the way Liberty Prime works. And I, and I love going over some of the, I don't know, some of the nitty gritty stuff, some of the weird things that happen because it's a video game. So let's just, we'll dig into some of these things. So, um, <laughs> so this one's fun. Uh, Prime is immune to all kinds of conventional attacks. This is in Fallout 3. So while, while Prime's walking around. So uh, any of the shots and things don't actually do damage to the character in the game. Um, and th Prime can actually defeat the energy barriers just by walking into them. It just blows them up. Um, sometimes the robot will actually grab them and, and rip them down. All, of course, while spouting anti-communist propaganda so that's pretty cool um in the games the liberty prime follows pre-scripted paths so there's not really even though the robot itself in in the lore has like an ai and can go where it wants in the game it's just a scripted path it, it only goes one direction like you replay the sections it'll never go a different direction unless the game messes up right so all of that stuff is scripted. But one of the funniest things that can happen in Fallout 3 is the robot, of course, can't be killed. It's not it doesn't actually have like a health bar, even though it has something like five million hit points in the game. It doesn't actually take damage. So those hit points never go down. But if you do attack it enough, it can turn hostile and it will attempt to kill you and your friends. This is possible in Fallout 3. It can happen. So maybe don't try to fight Liberty Prime because there's you're not going to win unless, of course, you mod it or, you know, turn on God mode or I don't know, do something else. Right now in Fallout 4, it does some other cool stuff, including being able to uh, walk in the water and also use its laser to like burrow into the ground, which is cool. Um, but and this is cool. Y you can actually target it in vats which is interesting. It still doesn't take damage, but in Fallout 4, it doesn't actually turn hostile. But you do have the ability to accidentally or intentionally get underneath its feet and be trampled to death. <laughs> so, that, so that is a thing that can happen as well. So there you go. That's Liberty Prime for you. <laughs> Five million hit points. Uh, and this is fun too. The um, Liberty Laser in both games has a damage rating of a thousand. The bomb weapons, uh, the basic bomb weapons, two hundred. And then in Fallout Four, there's 
what's called the bomb weapon special, which has a thousand damage also. Um, and it by default has the same bloody mess perk that you can get, which basically means whenever it does any damage to anything, kills it. If it just splatters everywhere, of course, of course it does. Uh, why would you want anything less? Right? <laughs> so, oh man, good old Liberty prime. Well, there you go, everybody. So, uh, how'd you feel about that? Uh, Liberty prime. I am Liberty prime. I am America. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I will be back next week with another episode. It will be our patron episode already. This has been a short month, but we'll be doing that on Tuesday night. And then we'll be back to some other regular episodes. So stay tuned for that. And until then, if you're out in the wasteland and a giant robot's walking around, don't tell him you're communist. I mean, even if you are, I mean, maybe you are. I don't know. Don't tell him you're communist, though, because he will shoot you with a giant laser and step on your head. All right. I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. To plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.